Welcome to Crowdfunding Countdown, where we take a look at all the board game campaigns finishing up this week. This episode, fittingly, is brought to you by Shakedown City, aka Crowdfunding. It's just, it's just crowdfunding. It's not, it's not a sponsor. That's actually a campaign that's on Kickstarter. It's an RPG of some sort. It's my joke. It's the one-off intro joke. Get over it. <laughs> I don't know. That was very aggressive. But I mean, if your RPG doesn't have bad boys or wicked women in them, well, then I am not interested. I don't know how many times I have to say this. Why are you making me cover them? I'm the one who brought it up. This episode's already off the rails. Hey, everybody. It's Chris George. Welcome to Room and Board. And we're going to take a look at all the crowdfunding campaigns finishing up this week. Hence the name, Crowdfunding Countdown. And that includes Kickstarter. That includes GameFound. That includes BackerKit. Well, it's still mostly Kickstarter. But if you do tune into BackerKit, you can get yourself some pizza pins. And of course, that's pins with a Z. Like La Z Boy or ZZ Top. Or the animal Zedbra. It's not even a... <laughs> oh no, I guess it is. I guess that one does work. I didn't think it worked, but it does work. Anyway, Pizza Pins finishes Friday. We're getting ahead of ourselves. First off, before we get into the games, shout out to my newest patron, Felix. Thank you so much for jumping on board. Felix has dethroned Steven as patron of the week. Maybe you should have fought harder for Attack on Titan in our last death match, Steven. But now Felix has taken over the crown like a sneaky little bush boy in Fortnite. That's, that's my strategy. Hide in a bush, wait till a crown drops in front of you and run out and try to win. But yeah, Felix, thank you so much for jumping on board and supporting the channel. And to all of my patrons, except for Steven, you got your moment in the sun last week and you'll never get it again. Thank you for continuing to support the channel. It really means a heck of a lot week after week. I see you on other channels in the comments supporting me and it's just it's just awesome to have you as part of this community as well. And, and everybody is part of the community. But I, of course I want to highlight the patrons because they help me keep justifying the amount of time that I end up spending on these videos. These videos in particular. I am consistently grateful. So grateful I would love to moisten my cheeks with gratitude juice, but I don't want to seem unseemly. So let's get into the week. We've got a bigger week this week. Definitely bigger than last week. That one was kind of a dud. Let's not waste any more time. First off, we have Space Lane Trader. And the first note that I, I clearly, I usually write a lot of notes or scripts for, for the videos, but the first note that I have that was clearly an unfinished thought was, or if you're feeling cheeky, sell it to the, and that was it. And that's part of their main Kickstarter video. They say, if you're feeling cheeky, you can sell your goods to the illegal routes. Cause basically space lane trader is primarily a pickup and deliver game. If you like your rule books with a lot of lore and a little rules, well then this is the game to check out. In a nutshell, you're going to be picking up your goods from various planets, taking them to other planets, and then selling them for a profit, as most pick up and deliver games go by. But the key element of this is if you do it legally or illegally, if you're feeling cheeky. And obviously the correct choice for all my parole officers watching is illegally. And I just hope I get points for being honest. No, I have not left Canada in the last month. Please don't check the other videos. Because the main determinant of how much these goods are going to cost is going to be this little market on the side, and these are going to fluctuate throughout the game. But also whenever you head to a new planet, you're going to draw this event card, and something will happen. So you might have a profitable windfall and you might get to do some stuff or you might have some negative effects that affect a resource that you weren't even considering getting. So that's kind of the flow of the game. They recommend the game in the rulebook for four people if you're interested. If you're not playing with four people you just have to cover planets to basically reduce the size of the map. But they really seem to be suggesting in the rulebook you should really play this with four people. This was designed for four people but if you want which isn't the greatest selling <laughs> aspect to it, but it's, hey, it's great that they're being upfront about this, that four players is the optimal player count in their mind. And so if you like a game that is about anticipating markets where you get to upgrade your player and your ship, although it seems like the upgrades on your player are gonna be a little bit more exciting than the ship, then check this one out. It's not bad, but after the shipping, which is around 15 to 19 euros, it brings it to about 78 euros for me, which is $106 Canadian. And again, my rule of thumb is when it's over that $100 bar, it has to be something really special. So this is one that I think looks good and I would try, but I wouldn't necessarily buy it. But if you're interested, that finishes tomorrow, Tuesday, June 28th at 11 a.m. This must have been a shorter campaign as well because I didn't see it in my last week's roundup. I would have loved to talk about it back then because <laughs> the pickings were slim and this really would have shone. Anyway, next up we have Umbrella Academy and this is a game where you play as the member of the Umbrella Academy and try to take down an evil villain. And thank goodness 
That villain is not the horrendous garbage abomination Umbrello from Tabletop Town Tussle. That's the, that's the actual thing, right? <laughs> Townsfolk Tussle, that I have a completely unfounded hatred for. He just gives me the friggin' creep. So you get to choose one of the five characters, but really you're gonna choose Seance because the sculpt looks really cool. He's floating in the air and he's held up by his coat. That's how they built the mini. I just thought that looked neat. And so obviously you're gonna play that and then your other players will play somebody else random, like number five, who I guess is okay because my good friend Sean Sullivan plays the older version of him in the television show, which might be a spoiler, it might not. I didn't get past episode four. Sorry, Sean. But the Umbrella Academy, this game looks barely fine, I would classify it as. It already feels very unintuitive from the video, which I get absolutely nothing from, and then even moving on to the rule book, which you get some from, it just feels, already feels potentially unnecessarily fiddly. For example, villains will follow you if you leave a location. You're gonna to try to be managing these various locations as they have crisis cards that are basically coming up. They're called hazards, but it's the same thing. And so if you leave an area, all the villains will follow you because, you know, that's what villains do. They love to chase people. Unless they're tied down by another hero or a number of heroes. But the number of heroes that ties them down also includes you, who actually just left. So if there were three villains, this is the example they give in the rulebook, if there are three villains there and two heroes and you leave, only one will follow you because two are tied down, but you left and now the other one isn't tied down. Just thematically, I understand it from a mechanics point and a balance perspective. That's what probably has to happen. It's the same reason why you have one extra dice than your characters in Dead of Winter so that you can actually do something on your team and manage the board. Like, I understand how that works out. It just... Uh, ugh. It's just a bad explanation and it just doesn't make sense thematically or feels fiddly. So that's kind of how the game feels to me. That's the impression that it gives forward. The game is basically playing cards from your hand to deal with the hazards at the various locations and biding your time until the final boss fight. So there you go. You can only get the collector's edition in this game found campaign. It's 70 pounds, $110 Canadian plus 13 to 17 pounds on average for shipping, which works out for me to be $137 Canadian, and that is, pff, no, no way. The minis look fun, the minis also feel incredibly unnecessary because they are going to be just, you know, managed. They're tokens that you manage on a board, right? But I guess you could say that for anything. Anyway, if you are interested, you have until Wednesday, June 29th at 1 p.m. over on GameFound to decide. Now, next up, we have the Ancient Blood soundtrack. Oh, and you can also purchase a pledge of the base game as well, and the expansions, but really, we're over on Kickstarter, so we're really just very excited about the soundtrack that we're producing. And it's not an excuse to just try to get more orders for Ancient Blood before they start, you know, sending it to the printing press. Because Ancient Blood was in the first crowdfunding countdown of this year, of 2022, and that's not a lot of time for there to be another re reprint. In fact, it isn't a reprint. You're just basically tacking on to the pledge manager. And I'm not quite sure why they're not just sticking with GameFound and letting people do late pledges over at GameFound, or maybe they thought that this new campaign would drum up a little bit more support. But it seems odd that having run a successful campaign that raised $500,000, you'd then try to return to Kickstarter for just a little bit more when you could just take late pledges and not get charged the 5% that Kickstarter is going to charge you. They've raised $28,000, so... I guess everybody who wanted Ancient Blood found out about it, or close to everybody. I mean, $28,000, that's, hey, I scoff at that number like I've ever seen it in my life. But <laughs> I think, but I think it's just, it's just weird. I do like that maybe they were returning because they wanted to unlock more stretch goals. They had more stretch goals planned and they couldn't get to them. And so they thought, hey, well, we'll, we'll make a big show of it. And any of the stretch goals that they unlock in this one will also be unlocked for anyone who pledged in the GameFound campaign. I think that's really cool. And I also think it's really cool that they aren't jacking up their prices as you would assume they would be as this sort of second chance idea. But the base pledge is still 135 bucks US and with the expansion, it's still 180 bucks US, which it was on GameFound. Trust me, I look these things up. <laughs> so you do not have to. So it's cool. It's, it's basically just another chance to get in on the campaign. I'm not gonna cover it too much because I covered it again in that January video if you want go check that one out and, and look, go to the Ancient Blood section because I used all my jokes up. It's the same video. I can't recycle the jokes, he says, as he makes the same joke basically over and over and over again. 
Anyway, I, I remember liking that you can pull the vampires out into the sunlight and then they'll just spontaneously combust. And you're gonna have to manage this and you're gonna go down branching paths and try different scenarios. It's a campaign game, but you, you can also do it one shot as you can do with any campaign game by just opening the book and picking a scenario. So I guess the moral of this story is that GameFound wins. With the same game on GameFound, you raise $500,000 and then over on Kickstarter, you only raise 28,000. Clearly, GameFound is the superior platform, right? It has nothing to do with, you know, everybody just putting their money there first and nobody else really wanting it because they didn't really do any extra marketing or people would have been confused because they go to the GameFound pledge and... No, it's none of that. I'm fairly certain this is an elaborate publicity stunt by GameFound that has worked and has now definitively proved, if it's definitive, it's definitive, that GameFound is the better crowdfunding platform. Congratulations, you won! Anyway, if you want another chance to get in on Ancient Blood, you can do that Thursday, June 30th at 1pm, or you can likely wait until they open it up again for late pledges and then just get it then. Now our next game answers the question, what do people love more than dragging vampires into the sun and watching them explode? Well, of course, that answer is hunting for nuts in Nut Hunt, where you get to earn points by building little squirrel nests and competing for secret objectives. So this game, it seems pretty simple, pretty light, takes place on a modular board, and the first thing you're gonna do is roll a dice and that'll determine which direction the fox moves. And the fox moves into a space with some squirrels and then they scatter everywhere. And it's not quite clear in the rule book if it's the fox player, the person who moves the fox, who gets to choose where the squirrels go, where all the squirrels go, or if it's just if you control your squirrels, you choose where they go. I assume it's the second one, just for mechanically that would make more sense, would make the game feel less, you know, plotting and random, or the, having the power being all in one person. But that sort of thing needs to be clarified in the rule book. And then after the fox is moved on your turn, you get to either recruit a squirrel, or you're gonna pay the cost of a particular tile and you just get to put a squirrel in there. They just burst forth from the nuts. You call them with the nuts, you throw some nuts, and obviously a squirrel will appear, as the old adage goes. Or you can annoy the fox, where you get to move the fox, basically, and scatter some squirrels. And by doing that, you also get resources. You get the nuts that you used to annoy the fox. Because thematically, you're throwing a nut at the fox, and that's why you get a nut when you do it. I wouldn't worry about it. I wouldn't look into this too much. It's called Nut Hunt. Let's just leave it at that. Or finally on your turn you can get an objective cards and these are basically like routes and tickets to ride. You have to have a presence on the board to score them at the end. And once somebody's gotten their fourth nest, the game is over, then you count up your points through your objectives and whatever. And this actually seems, I've been teasing it a bit, but it seems pretty fun. Honestly, it's area control while hassling foxes and getting your little squirrels together to make nests. And I think the idea of moving the fox to push your squirrels into an area that was harder for them to get to so that all three of them could link up and form a nest is kind of a fun one. It kind of reminds me of Boop, which will be coming up from Smirk and Dagger later, later on. I think they're releasing it at Gen Con but I saw it at Origins when I was there where you're just, you know, moving cats on a bed and they're constantly pushing each other off to the side. It gives me that same sort of feeling and I think it's interesting. I also think it's interesting, and I never learned this about squirrels before now, that a squirrel's favorite game has always been Trio, which I definitely covered back in the day and remains the number one game you should play at a convention. It's a game about threesomes akin to other devilishly dice-based games that we have referenced on this channel. And so now I know it does take three squirrels to make a nest. I didn't trust Furry Scott Bakula back in the day when he told me that, but if you want to have a real nut hunt, well, of course you're going to need at least three squirrels. Just two squirrels? <sighs> Not much of a hunt. Anyway, this is 35 bucks US plus $14 shipping to get it to Canada, but you can get cheaper shipping if you get a, a bundle of two as I'm sure is thematically related to some sort of nuts. It's still $49 US, $63 to get it to me here in Canada. I think it's, again, it's one of those things where I would, I would probably enjoy playing it, but I don't necessarily have a desire to currently own it. But if you do, well, hey, maybe you just want to have something that says Nut Hunt on your shelf, and who can blame you? That finishes June 30th at 4 p.m. Next up! We have Return to Dark Tower, the RPG. So if you were like me and you saw Return to Dark Tower and you thought, wow, are they having another Kickstarter for the, you know, super popular and successful game that Restoration Games put out, raised about $4 million on Kickstarter. It's a reimagining of the classic game, which I don't think anybody knows really that much about, other than there's a big, cool dark tower in the middle. And of course, if Nut Hunt has taught us anything, it's that a big, giant spire right in the center of the table is good for 
a great time. Well, then you, you should get Return from Dark Tower. So this is just an RPG based on the name. Again, one that has a severe lack of wicked bad boys and bad wicked women. So therefore, I'm not interested. But if you got excited and then went, oh shoot, know that Restoration Games is actually coming out with an expansion for Return to Dark Tower. That's happening July 26th over on Backer Kit. So Backer Kit will soon start to become a relevant part of the conversation. And I'll see you over there for five reasons and a reason to actually look into it later on. <laughs> anyway, that's it for this one. Just wanted to mention that in case you saw it and were like, oh, is that happening? It's not. <laughs> Let's move on. Next up, we have a game called First in Flight, and this is a deck building game meets push your luck, which looks all right. The goal of the game is to make the best flying machine, and you're going to do that by just flying the longest. It doesn't matter if it's actually sustainable. It just matters if you fly the long, longest amount. You're the closest to flight, and you're going to do that by building your deck of new ingenious things that you've now stuck onto your plane with super glue and also filling it with some slightly smaller and less ingenious defects that if you draw too many of them, you will fall to the ground and burst in flames. So as long as you don't show people your design flaws, then you'll fly. <laughs> it's an exercise in belief. <laughs> Just close your eyes, grab onto the steering wheel, and hope you make it home, as I do anytime my grandma's driving. So yeah, as the video says, push your luck too much and you will go down in flames. The stakes are very high here, and so are the planes. <laughs> you're also gonna be moving your own little person across a track <laughs> to Kaido or park style, where if you're in behind, you get to take the next action. And so just stay behind and take as many actions as you possibly can. And those actions can be like upgrading your flyer, getting more cards, a bunch of different stuff. I think the real key to zone in on here is if you want to look into it further is if you think that deck building and push your luck aspect will be fun, right? That's the game. That's the meat of the game. And then the other actions are just, you know, frosting. Meat and frosting. Part of a balanced breakfast. This is also a game that I think would be better at more than two. If you're primarily a two player, I wouldn't really look into it because of that mechanic of the person who's in last always moving. You're going to have to have a little bot that you control and... I've never enjoyed that aspect of Takedo. I think Takedo is best at four, and I think it's, ju it's just it's just okay then. I think the movement aspect of that last player track is much more exciting when there are more people kind of shifting up the decision space. Anyway, this is $39 US, $51 Canadian. That seems pretty reasonable. And then shipping for me is about $17 more, so after conversion it works out to be about $72 Canadian for me. It's getting more reasonable. It is, I'm just not as drawn in necessarily by the push your luck deck building aspect, although I do like deck building. So it just doesn't hit that $72 price point for me in terms of what I would want or the amount of times that I envision I would play it. But if you're interested, check it out. That's June 30th at 10 p.m. Now, next up, we have the Bot Factory. And Sandra is back. Queen Sandra has returned. Unfortunately, not that Queen Sandra. It's Sandra, the production manager of Kanban EV. She's not satisfied with just making electric cars. No, she has now moved on to bots. She is interested in taking our livelihood as humans from us. What sort of monsters are you creating in this bot factory, Sandra? You've taken our fossil fuels, and now you'll take our wives and husbands. I do not know what sort of bots. Oh, they're toys. They're just, they're toys. So it's probably fine, and we shouldn't worry about all the AI chips that Sandra is conspicuously, very conspicuously installing from that giant box that's labeled definitely not the Terminator program. <laughs> Please look the other way. Continue going back to work. All is fine. I don't know why she needed to make that label, but she did. What are you doing, Sandra? I've seen iRobot. You shouldn't mess with AI. But Sandra's, you know, maniacal proclivities aside, the game is to make a bunch of bots. You're going to be getting the heads and the bodies and the legs of the bots, and you're going to be smushing them together to fulfill contracts, basically. Blueprints. They say, I want a green bot, and so you're going to have to get a green head and a green torso and a green legs. And the game continues until all bots of one color have been built, or a player has completed five bots. And so the play of the game is basically you're going to move your worker to an action space and do that action. Or if Sandra's watching, then you have to make a big speech about why you're doing that action and why it's the most productive thing to do. I mean, this is just a monstrous theme. Can I double down on this? I'm gonna. You're making toys, which should be fun, 
right? But you have to constantly justify yourself to the maniacal efficiency monster that is Sandra, who will just spank your bare bottom raw if you don't get back to work, you slave to the capitalist machine, you human monkey wrench, you tin man at the end of sweaty brick road. Work harder. Yes, work faster. Yes, you are the real heroes and not those pathetic little elves up at the North Pole. You are creating the future. You're creating new children, new toys for children. Sorry, pardon me. You're certainly not creating mechanical children who will suck every last living drop out of the lifeblood of humanity because Sand And for each one of your completed bots, you gain victory points listed on the side of the bot board by the finance track. More bots of a color means more points. Confirm. <clears throat> Sorry, I think I did a pretty good job explaining the game. <laughs> Put your person out. Take the action. Get your bot parts. Stuff them into one full bot. Complete your contracts. Get the correct color for the bots that are worth four points at the end. It clocks in at $48 US, $62 Canadian. And so after shipping, which isn't severe, it's like $9 to $14, feels pretty good. It still works out to potentially a similar price point than you'll see at retail. But I also think everybody should go check this campaign out. And the link that I put to this campaign will link to this actual update because they've had a lot of trouble funding this one, which is surprising because Eagle Griffin Games and Vital Lacerda Usually it's just like, hey, you want half a million dollars? Sure, just slap those two things together. But they really had a difficult time funding this and they put together a really nice post going through why things may not be cheaper at retail. And this is true. I talk a lot about retail in these crowdfunding countdowns because I think, hey, stop with the shipping, just get it from your local retail store. And this is a legitimate strategy that I think is the correct way to go about most things, especially if you're not interested in the exclusives or the stretch goals, right? But this is also why I say check in with your local store and to see if they are going to get an order or if there will be this mass production. Because the reason Kickstarter and board games have meshed together so well is because it is this pre-order system. They know the print run that they're going to have to get. And that's always been the concept of stretch goals, right? As the margins decrease or the more packages that you get, the more stretch goals you can add in because you can use that excess money to purchase more cool things for your backers and the consumers therefore always win, right? And it's now shifted into this expectation and into this premium outlet where people can get premium things. And that's okay. Well, you know, if you want those premium things, because the expectation has shifted and the expectation, I think on both sides with companies thinking what consumers want and what consumers want, which is just more, but they expect these unlocks to happen regardless of funding goal and expect that the unlocks are already baked into the price point rather than existing as these potential savings and these potential return on more people supporting the project, as it, I believe, once was. I think the mindset about retail needs to potentially shift or potentially just be more aware as a consumer when things will make it to retail and when things won't. Going back to my point that I say just get it at retail, I'll try to highlight when I don't think things will be widely available at retail, and often, as a rule of thumb, if a campaign's made, you know, less than $200,000, it's not going to be widely available in retail. And that's why you always have to contact your store, see what they are going to be selling it for, and then see if that will be a deal. And if it's enough of a deal that you want to support your store versus supporting more of that towards the publisher because that's also what the publisher gets. If you order directly from them, they can cut out the middleman or one of them at least and get more funds into their own company and can hopefully continue creating things that you like. It's kind of a tangent, but I really think it's worthwhile and not, not that my tangent's worthwhile, but it's worthwhile going to check out the response from Eagle Griffin Games because I thought it was a very candid and honest approach saying, listen, our MSRP is this right now, but if we don't sell enough copies, the print run will be smaller and therefore the MSRP will have to be larger just to account for that because there's a economy of scale that we won't have access to. And so I really appreciated it and thought it was refreshing and was nice refreshing communication from a company that has done very well over the course of its history. And it seems like they really want to get Bot Factory to backers and now it's crossed the threshold. It was really struggling for a while until they put up these 50 packages, 150 total, of Lacerda's other games you could get on Mars, or Lisboa, or Kanban EV, and Bot Factory, and they're gonna throw in Mercado de, de Lisboa because, I don't know, I think the Dice Tower hated that and so nobody's ever gonna buy a copy 
Uh, and so you could get these three games as a bundle deal for $150 US or around $200 Canadian. And that, I wish they were still around because for deal value, honestly, that would be my pick of the week. I know it's an expensive price point, but Vitale Lacerda's games on Mars, Lisboa, Kanban, they sell for $160 to $180 Canadian. And the fact that you then get Bot Factory and another game for just that extra 20 bucks. Hey, I was surprised as you are, but I was contemplating it even. Unfortunately, if you're watching this now, they're all gone, or you can maybe scoop up one as somebody drops out if you do nothing but sit at your computer and refresh it over and over and over again. But you wouldn't have missed out if you were a member of my Patreon and were on our Discord because we were talking about it over there. <laughs> FOMO alert. <laughs> Think about how many deals you save joining the Room and Board Patreon. <laughs> Uh, no, it's great because we do have a community of people who are obsessed with Kickstarters that desperately need my help as a registered and legal therapist, uh, <laughs> talking them down from making irresponsible fiscal decisions, and uh, whom all of whom I love. And we were talking about it over there, and they, they're the ones who brought it to my attention because they always snipe out the deals, and I always just focus on the games when they come to this final week so that I can, you know, manage my workload and try to catch those campaigns that only pop up for a week that we can then use their ending date as a bar. Anyway, this segment has been long enough. If Bot Factory looks interesting to you, it's Lacerda Light, and so therefore it comes with a Lacerda Light price point. After shipping for me, it's still around that $82 mark, and it is too light for that. I would contemplate if one of those bundles dropped out, I'd have to look into Mercado de Lisboa a little bit more, and I'd probably opt for On Mars, literally because it's the most expensive one and not because I'm the most interested in it. But I doubt those will become available again. It's also worth noting that Eagle Griffin Games might do this from time to time if they're having another bad Kickstarter or less funded Kickstarter to try to, you know, get some more support behind it and sell some other things at a cheaper rate. So if you're interested in Bot Factory and just Bot Factory, that finishes Friday, July 1st at 11 a.m. Moving on to Skyrise. And this video is a hype machine. It's awesome voice acting, pretty pictures. It doesn't even matter what the game is. I'm interested in it. But the game in itself is actually quite simple. Only an eight page rule book to get through. And it's by Roxley Games and Roxley has been doing quite well. Their last Kickstarter, I think was Radlands, unless I'm missing one. And that has been really well received. They're also behind Santorini, which I just need to just go get at the damn store. <laughs> Cause it's like 30 bucks or I think it's 40. And I think I'm waiting to try to get on the second hand market for like 25. They've also got brass on their lineup. At least that's what they say in their Kickstarter. Anyway, this is an auction game with tight decisions, as the video says. If you like that sort of things, if you like your game with like really tight decision making, if, if you're interested in games that get you really thinking about close decisions and have that push and pull, and you, if you like strategy at all, maybe you don't like strategy, then you won't like our amazing game. But if you like this game with tight decisions, well, you know, then check it out, up to you. I mean, it's a good campaign, but this does actually look like a good game as well. You're going to be building buildings on neighborhoods and these neighborhoods will have various tokens on them. They'll either be color tokens to represent the different neighborhood colors or they'll be patron tokens representing specific commissions that you do for various influential people around the city. But these commissions will be of different value because Moneybags McGee over there may look good, but it depends what he pays. That's actually what matters. And at the end of the game, you'll score points for these patron tokens and you'll also score points for all of your buildings and you're multiplied by that by the number of tokens that you have. So you wanna specialize a bit in specific buildings, but then block off your opponents. And how the auction mechanic works is very simple. You put down a building and you say, I want this territory and I'm bidding this weight of building. Everybody has the same buildings. They're all worth different values. And then somebody will put a building down next to, in a space next to your building and say, well, I want this space and my building costs more than yours. And then somebody else will put down one next to them and you'll expand that way across the board. But I think this is interesting because you can always see what everybody else has, which I wasn't sure if I'd be on board with because I like having to keep track of that sort of stuff. But I think I do like it because it makes holding on to the stronger thing really powerful and you can just throw your weight around the board a lot more. So you can always see what everybody has and you're also seeing what tokens they have. And so even in the bidding process, you can bid on a neighborhood that maybe you don't want. 
at all, but you're putting your building there so that the other person can't put a better building there because only one building can occupy one neighborhood during this bidding process. Anyway, whoever has the highest building wins that bid, they get to keep their building on the board, everybody else takes their buildings back, and they get whatever tokens were in the neighborhood. That's it. You just keep doing that until, you know, the end of a designated amount of turns and see who wins based around the points from your patrons and the points from the tokens. It's very intriguing to me. As an auction game, it seems fun. It's even more intriguing to me because of their 30 alluring objective cards, as the video highlights. I do want a secret objective that lets me put my building in one particular spot. I do want that. I am a lord! <laughs> so they have a base game and a deluxe game. The base game will have wooden buildings, the deluxe game will have plastic buildings. It's $49 US, $63 for the base. It's $75 US, $96 Canadian for the deluxified edition. And shipping's pretty good. It's all nine bucks to the US, $15 to Canada. And so you're paying $80 Canadian for that base game. That's kind of your final cost, or at least my final cost here in Canada. But wait, there's more, because you can also back with a buddy, and then every second copy, you get 20% off the lowest copy, which like, it just seems overly complicated. Just give discounts for group buys. Just give 10% for everybody if you buy more than two. Just do that instead. Don't make it okay, yeah, but if you buy a deluxe and then you buy a base game, we're gonna take the 20% off the base game. I mean, I get it you're upselling, but just uh, make it simpler. It's not It's not that complex, it is pretty simple. And I do love when companies offer group buys, so I'm not gonna complain that much. So if you know people who are interested in this game, seek out these group buys because you can get 10% off and you can save on the shipping when you bundle everything together. Anyway, if you're interested in that, check that out. That also finishes Friday, July 1st at 12.09 a.m. Next up, we have Septima. The witches are back. Remove your shoes. Remove your wings. Ah, that's an, that's my Angelica Houston impression in The Witches. Witches work only with magic! Anyway, the Grand Septima is dying, or she's retiring and moving to a farm upstate. And she's had a vision that somebody else will become the new Septima. I mean, she could just say, I'm, I'm out of here, someone else needs to take up Septima. But she had a vision because, you know, it's more witch-like. Luckily, you are nice witches and you aren't like Angelica Houston who traumatized my entire childhood. For every weekend, over a year, we all got to rotate what movie we would rent every weekend from Jumbo Video. And uh, we usually ended up on renting The Witches until my parents got tired of renting it over and over and over again and just decided to buy the video. This is a good racket and a very smart way to get more movies into your household back when movies didn't just all exist on Netflix. I also think this was more my siblings doing and not mine, but I pretended it was my doing as well because I'm the youngest. I was like, I also like the things that my older siblings like. Does that make me cool? <laughs> Anyway, back to Septima, the actual Septima. I played this at Origins. I played the first round as a demo at Origins, and it's really fun. The basic outline of the game is you are going to be gathering resources from the forest, using those resources to create potions, and healing the sick in the middle of the town, while also trying to infiltrate the town square because some witches aren't as sneaky as you and they've been caught by witch hunters. They're gonna be on trial and people are mad at magic inexplicably since it's literally been saving the town like all the witches have been doing is helping the town and yet you backwoods idiots don't care that you're living in a magical town where you can learn from witches who also are doing most of their magic through potion making which means you as a normal citizen could learn the ways of making potions it's not like your harry potter magic here you can learn this magic you closed-minded simpletons anyway this Switches will be on trial and you're trying to get your friendly citizens into that trial to make sure that they vote for not burning and then save the witch and put it into your own little coven. So everyone's gonna have their own little coven that they can build up over the course of the game and add new witches to, which will have new abilities. I am looking forward to playing a full game. I was uh, bummed that we had to stop. There's one aspect that people may not like, and that is whenever you do magic, you raise your suspicion level up. And the more suspicion level you have, the more spaces a ghost, a ghost hunter, a witch hunter will chase you because if they're in your zone, they're like, I smell magic. And they go out and just try to be the biggest pieces of garbage in the world. But they roll a dice to determine if they get more or less movement. And that's the one part which 
I think people may dislike because you can prepare and then just get screwed by a dice roll, or you can be really bold and brash and then save yourself with a dice roll, which I quite enjoy doing. And, well, let's just say that uh, I've learned a thing or two from Septima over the years in terms of how to roll a dice. But I think people may dislike that, so keep that in mind if you are thinking of backing. And also keep in mind that this is the deluxe version. 75 euros, or $102 Canadian after shipping. It works out to like $130 Canadian for me. And you do get an expansion in this package deal. You get these shapes and omens where you can shapeshift yourself into an animal because witch hunters don't find that suspicious. Seeing in the clearing a person just turn themselves into a fox is not suspicious at all. And yet if you picked a little plant at the same time as somebody else picked a little plant, they're like, wait a minute, that, that there, they both are gathering herbs. That's friggin' weird. Uh, <laughs> anyway, you can reduce your suspicion level. You can avoid witch hunters. The omens just add additional things to the Septima's predictions, what's happening during that specific round. So even though you do get that expansion, I imagine that the retail version will be enough for me. This is one that I likely will get at retail or likely will message Mind Clash Games and say, hey, you want a review out there, don't you? <laughs> But if they don't go for that, then I'll probably just get it at retail and then review it and say, hey, if you'd sent this to me, you, uh, you would have gotten the exact same uh, praise that I'm giving it now, but I wouldn't have given you money. That doesn't seem like a good pitch, does it? We'll work on that. I love in the campaign they do highlight the differences between the two, what you are getting, so you can see if you want those wooden resources versus the cardboard resources. When I was playing, I actually thought as I was picking up the wooden resources, I was like, oh yeah, these are nice and chonky and also unnecessary at the time. I was like, they're kind of big. <laughs> Honestly, I wish they were smaller. And so I think I'm gonna be completely fine with the retail version. It's cool to see Mind Clash go into this lighter fare. It's definitely lighter than Anachrony. They pitched it to me as, oh, you know when you can't get Anachrony to the table because it's too long and complicated? Then you could play Zeptima. I was like, oh wow, this is gonna be very similar. And it wasn't at all. That's a bad pitch. But the pitch is that it is more accessible. Right? The pitch is that it's by Mind Clash Games, who you know and love, and that it's more accessible. I, I likely will end up picking up a copy, because watching the video makes me want to play it again, even though I already know for a fact who the next Septima will be, and of course, it's Maggie. It's always been Maggie. I put a spell on you, honey. Yeah, you do, baby. You know you do. Because you're mine. Stop, we're on camera. Oh, just a little smooch. Maggie. Come on. Later. Oh, okay. Jeez. Talk about a, a wicked woman. Hey yo! Hello. Anyway, if you are interested in that deluxe version, check it out. The finishes July 1st at 1 p.m. And speaking of predicting the future and magic, next up we have this board game uh, Judah commercial. I almost said the word that it actually was, and I can't say that. Board game something or other. Next to board games, Kickstarter Tabletop Leech. It's the 8-bit tarot deck. It's just a tarot deck but the cards are 8-bit figures. Because you know what? Nerds can predict the future too. It doesn't seem like a good deal. It's 31 Canadian for a small version, 45 Canadian for a larger version, and then you have to add shipping on that. But then again, can you really put a price on knowing the unknowable? I think not. That's it. I, I figured I'd mention it if somebody was interested, if someone's interested in tarot cards. I, I, I had someone do my tarot cards in university. It was the most wonderful feeling because they drew nothing but suns, basically. There were other cards, but it was mostly the suns or the yellow card. And they said, wow, I've never seen anybody so happy. And then the world ended and I've, I've never had that tarot reading ever again. I mean, I did do a small reading for myself the other day. I just drew five cards uh, and I got the fool, the beggar, death, death, death. Not sure what that means. I hope its meaning won't be revealed immediately in our next campaign. It probably won't be. If you're interested in that, check it out. <laughs> That's July 1st at 2.59 p.m. Now next up, unrelated, we have Suro, the deluxe luxury opulent edition, official title. And if you're ready for a campaign that is counter to almost every single value I hold dear, well, check out Suro, because it's coming in a big wooden box with a $350 price tag. U.S. $450 price tag Canadian. The Suro Limited Luxury Edition. I mean, to get this game, you have to have either unlimited money or it has to be your favorite game of all time, right? I mean, it has to be your favorite game of all time. And if it is your favorite game of all time, great! This is probably the best thing in the world. And yet, no shade to Suro, I don't know 
anyone who this would be the best game of all time because it's fine it's a light little tile laying game you draw a tile you put on a map you try not to die it's life the board game it's carcassonne all roads lead to a volcano edition but i just don't don't see how you would ever want to pull it out and use it enough maybe because it plays up to eight players you can justify it. you can't it has to be your favorite board game of all time. It really does. And if it is, let me know. And let me know why Sorrow is your favorite board game of all time. And like, I'm so excited for you that you have this luxury edition. But I am still mad that it exists. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. People want what they want. It's raised over $200,000. That's how much people want it. It's obviously a very good decision to make, a business decision on their part. It's just like, you gotta let me know why. You really do. I'm really just like, I'm genuinely really curious because I cannot fathom how anybody ever in the world would spend money on that. Because it's beautiful, because it's crafted with wood, because it's homemade, well, you know, handcrafted. There's lots of other handcrafted things you could get. I don't know, let me know. If you're interested in that, that does finish Friday at 8 p.m. And may God have mercy on our souls. <laughs> Next up, we have the game Drags to Riches. And this one isn't funding, but it's really close, so I'm gonna cover it. And also I'm covering it because it's drag. Come on now. It's another drag game. I'm gonna be interested in talking about it, but this one is deck building. But honestly, the most important part to any drag game is not the mechanics or that they even work. It's what are the names of your characters? And let me tell you, by Felicia, oh, so good. That is very, very good. Kalisha Keys, exceptional. Jessica, Glam Stoker. I think I love Glam Stoker. By Felicia and Glam Stoker, those are my two favorites. Honestly, you should just back it based on the names. But the game is to be the best drag queen, of course, and you're going to do that by showing off your sickening looks, and you're gonna build these looks one piece at a time. But the intriguing part to me is that you can reveal your looks, which you place face down, to compete in the drag extravaganza, or you can save your look for another day and not tell anybody what's coming. So there might be a chance everybody decides to save their look and you can win the ball with just a pussycat wig and Joe Black's H&M dress. Because you know, that's how Anita Dick rolls. Anita Dick is my drag name if you missed the last time we had drag coverage. Or would be my drag name. I haven't, I'll never get to that level. I'm too afraid of, of tucking. I just don't get how they, they go back up. But that aside, you could win that ball, though, that event that everyone's competing over because everybody's too busy crafting the perfect look, like Suki Doll getting ready for anything, that they didn't even notice that you were able to swipe those points with just, you know, the bare minimum. So I think that aspect is fun, but you have to have the rule book on the main page. I don't care that it's in your FAQ and is the only FAQ. People are asking for it so much, Put it on your main page so that we can see the rule books, so that we can see that you are going to either play cards from your hand face up and use their ability and use them to purchase new items or play them face down and contribute them to your look. And you're gonna have that give and take, which I think also could be interesting. And so I hope this funds, obviously, because I'm an ally and it's Pride Month, but also because, you know, I think it could be decent. And also because I just love drag <laughs> and want more drag games out there. I think that's great. And Drag Race is gonna be officially over after this season because they can't do another season because All Stars is just so phenomenal right now. Anyway, the price point is 29 pounds for the base game and then another 20 pounds to get it to me for shipping. So after conversion, that's $77 Canadian and that unfortunately is a bit too much, especially when you see the size of the box, the potential size of the box and the prototype. I think it's it's just a bit too much. Generally, my cheap scale is like, if it was 50% of what it likely will be, I would get it. <laughs> Often what I want it to be, it is double. And that's kind of what, what this is. But if you are interested, check it out. That finishes July 3rd, that's Sunday at 2.29 a.m., AKA Saturday night. Next up, just a few more. One that I don't wanna mention, and yet I feel like I have to because it's a dumb campaign. It's dumb, but like in a dumb good way. It's a print and play campaign called Seafood. And I don't want to mention it because I have a cat and I do want to mention it because I ha now have a cat. And the whole thing is you print out a little sheet and you stick it in a, some cardboard and then you just let your cat push stuff on it to decide what they want for dinner. It's like bullseye, <laughs> but your cat's pushing it. It's so dumb, but you know, it's the it's a good it's a good dumb it's a really good dumb so check that out i guess or don't that's that's all i'll have to say about that it's like three bucks for print and play there you go or you could just draw 
you know, stuff on a piece of paper and play the same game. We're moving on <laughs> to our last game of the week, and that's a game called Employee of the Month. And so rather than working for Sandra, this one is a game that truly encapsulates what it's like on the workforce of today, in that the only way to succeed is to make others fail. Because your boss won't notice the mediocre job you're doing if he's too busy firing everybody else. So you try to get your whole team fired and be the last person standing. Because obviously, you're going to be the one to absorb their salaries along with the work that they left behind. That's definitely how corporations are run. You will receive extra compensation for that extra work. Anyway, the game's pretty simple. You have six cards in your hand, you play one, and that's how hard you're gonna work today. Or you can take a day off, that's one of the cards. If you work the hardest, you become Employee of the Month. And the person who works the least hardest, well, they get a strike against them, basically. Three strikes, you're out. But you can also, if people have worked really, really hard, if your value is one at the end of the round, because you all play your cards simultaneously, and then you get to play these politics cards, which are basically like adjusting your scores up and down. You can put them on yourself, put them on someone else. If you just have a one at the end and people are over five because they've worked so hard, you get to just take the dossier off their desk as they're sleeping and hand it in to yourself and say, look boss, this is all the work I did. And then you become employee of the month, which I think is a, a real, you know, embodiment of the workforce of today. Not that I'm mentioning any names, Kathy. Preparing for Motivational Monday is a full-time job. I would know. Anyway, it's $19 Canadian, which, you know, it's a light card game. It's fine. Shipping to Singapore is great. Three bucks. Shipping to Malaysia is okay. Nine bucks. Shipping to everybody else, it's not good enough. Especially because I think Coup is the better version of this sort of player elimination party game. But if you're in Singapore, check it out. That finishes next Tuesday, July 5th at 11.57 a.m. And then also finishing next Tuesday is the Sunny Geeks Table 1.5. This is by Rath Skellers. You may have heard of them if you've done any research into board game table companies. They're fairly well known and they apparently produce nice products. Not that they've ever sent me one. I don't want one. I don't have the space. And so this is another board game table campaign. And ah, I used all my jokes in the last campaign. It's true. <laughs> because there was a board game table campaign last week as well. So I'm not going to say too much about this. Um, don't buy a table in a week. Don't make that decision. That was our moral of the story last week. And also, one thing that I really do want to bring up about this is that this table does not cost 1,200 euros or 1638 Canadian. It actually costs 11.99. What a deal! Get it? No, actually, it doesn't cost that. It costs an additional $600 or 445 euros because you're going to have to get the drawers that go along with it. That's not factored into the cost. So if you were looking at this, know that you've been swindled, basically. You haven't been swindled. I mean, I assume it works without the drawers, but nowhere can I see how that actually looks like. Then would you just have a giant hanging chasm where the drawers should be? Which nobody's going to want either for their table. I wish they would actually show what it would look like without the drawers since their base cost is without the drawers. If you're gonna have a base cost for something, you need to show what it that is going to look like. You can't just show models of the better model and then assume people will upsell and get people in with a less scary price point to view because that's why they do it this way, right? Presumably, that's why all of the pictures and images are showing these drawers that you have to purchase for around 40% more than you're actually being quoted. And it just it just makes me mad. Because if that's actually a viable option and you can get the base price, then show us what it looks like and demonstrate it. Or stop showing us only the options with the drawers or include the drawers in that base price and then just show the price that it costs. It's annoying. It's just a blatant upsell and it makes me less inclined to move forward with that specific company. Because I like companies that are, you know, honest. <laughs> I'm not saying that they're not honest. That's, that's a bit of a harsh term. That's a bit of a... A uh, hot take that might be for someone else's uh, YouTube channel, but <clears throat> it is annoying from a consumer perspective, and I know it's only a marketing tactic. It's just so that initial cost feels lower when they know everybody's going to get the drawers, or somebody won't, and then look at their table and they'll be like, what is this weird space here? Because if you don't want the drawers, you wouldn't be looking at this model anyway. They have other tables that they can sell. This table, its whole gimmick is that it's modular and that you can swap things in and out. And so maybe that's the reason why they don't have the drawers. Maybe there are other modular things that you could swap into that space. But I don't think so. 
Maybe there are. Let me know if I if I am wrong in the comments and I'll pin it or something because I think that's important. That would mean the mixing and matching. But I still think you should incorporate some mixing and matching in that base price and then say you can swap things out. I don't know. They've likely put a lot more thought into it than I have. I just like to call it marketing ploys when I see them and that feels like a marketing ploy to me. But if you are getting the Sunny Geek or you were thinking about it, hey, you got till next July 5th to decide, although they do mention that they're like, hey, the sooner you book, the sooner your table's gonna come out because we can only produce 70 a month. So keep that in mind. Back it now, don't miss out. Or really fully investigate table companies. My neighbor's getting a table. I'll let you know if that's any good. And, uh, cause it's one that I don't think a lot of people have heard of. I'm probably wrong. Maybe I'm just saying that. It's just a very standard board game table <laughs> company. But I'm gonna pretend it's something exclusive and you're gonna have to tune into every video from here on out just to see if I figure it out. <laughs> anyway, that's it. That's it for the week. We've made it through another week. Thank you so much for sticking with me. Every week I do a pick for me and a pick for you. The pick for me being the game that I am the most interested in personally, either mechanically or whatnot, and the pick for you being the game that I think you should buy and I shouldn't spend my money on. That way I can play your copy instead. And this week there are two that stand out to me in terms of things that I'm interested in. And it's a tough call. I want, you know what, both of these are the picks for me and not the pick for you. No, I'll make the one pick for me. Okay, fine. Septima is going to be the pick for me. I'm, I'm quite interested in Septima. I'm interested in that retail capacity, but it, it is, it was a really fun demo. I can see the potential for it. I can see where it can go. And I can also see how it's not going to be for everyone. I think it is a lot lighter than what you normally get from Mind Clash, and I'm having a little bit of trouble deciding if it's too light. It's not. It's going to take two hours to play a game, but I didn't get a chance to play with the more advanced board. I just don't see that advanced board being significantly more advanced. I think I'm going to get it out, and I'm going to enjoy playing it, but I'm also hesitant that it will have uh, a bunch of longevity because of its lack of complexity, at least for me personally. So that's why Septum is my pick for me because it is it is a bit of a caveat. I really, really enjoyed the game and I enjoyed it enough that I am interested in picking it up at retail, but I also think that I am interested in picking it up because I know my girlfriend likes the theme of witches and that is a huge incentivizer for me to pick up something that is a good game that I could enjoy that has a witch theme that can maybe draw her in and play more games with me. But I think there's been a lot of buzz about Septima and I think that buzz is earned, but I also think that this could be just a good game and not a fantastic game. So keep that in mind. That's also why I am more interested in the retail aspect because if it's just a good game, well then I don't want a deluxe version of it. But yeah, I, I, I still would recommend it. I still think it is the pick for me. It is the thing that I am the most interested in out of all of this fair. And it is something that I will likely try and get a copy for to play and, and figure out that balance. But because of that, I don't necessarily know if it's the immediate Kickstarter buy that I expected it could be when I first sat down at the table. It is gorgeous though, so you never know. Anyway, that's my pick for me, Septima, or as I like to call it, come Bruno. I have your chocolate here. I was watching clips of the witches and it's still freaky. It's still a freaky movie. It gives me the jibblies. Anyway, pick for you is gonna be Skyrise. Ah, uh, and again, this kind of comes with a caveat. I know everybody's crazy about plastic. I know you're gonna just blow your budget on all the figures and you think, I didn't get Foundations of Rome and this one looks like it also has giant plastic buildings. I'm gonna get that instead. And hey, you know what? <laughs> I get it. <laughs> But I also think that the retail version of this will be completely fine. And Roxley seems to be doing fairly well that I anticipate this having a decent wide retail release. Almost at the $500,000 Canadian point. And that is where I feel comfortable that this will be at retail. And I think the wooden buildings would be just as good. Because it's not like you don't get buildings. You get wooden buildings or you get plastic buildings. So that being said, I think if you're able to get in on some bundle deals and get the discount, you might uh, have a good chance of getting an all right value or an all right value compared to what you'll pay at retail after tax, right? So that's why it's my pick for you. I think the auction looks slick. I like that it's eight pages of rules. I like that it's gonna be pretty accessible with some tight strategy and some alluring objective cards. Yeah, my pick for you is Skyrise. I think that one does look really fun and I would be very interested in trying that one out too. So that's it. Another week gone. Thank you so much for sticking around. If you're new to the channel, Thanks for being here. There's a channel, uh, Shira's channel, that's the name, 
that sent over some subscribers my way. So if you're tuning in this Monday, hey, thanks for being here. If you were here before that, well, hey, thanks for being here. It's the same. I mean, like, I appreciate you all. I appreciate you all watching. Let me know in the comments what you are excited for this week and upcoming, what you did end up backing. I know that there are some good ones this week, and I think some very legitimate backs, because I'm always interested in hearing what everybody's doing, what everyone's excited for, and yeah, I think it's just, it's just fun. Or just drop a comment for the algorithm because, I mean, no one's gonna click on these thumbnails anyway, let's be real. These are informational and not entertaining unless you are really interested in the information coming out. <laughs> or at least to like a lot of outside people going in, right? In terms of how YouTube suggests things. So I appreciate you sticking around. I appreciate you getting to this point. Thank you so much for watching. My name's Chris George and, oh, no, I, oh, this is embarrassing. I don't have a catchphrase. I gotta work on that. We'll work on that, whatever the case. Make sure you do the important thing and cover yourself in whipped cream and go take a nap in the old pig barn. See you in the next one.